Hi, I'm Brian Vines, and this is 112BK. Coming up, it's official. Amazon is opening up half of its HQ2 in Long Island City, and landlords are already angling to increase their rents. How can tenants protect themselves? I think this banding together and making sure that you're talking to your neighbors and talking to the people in not just your building, but the buildings around you and finding out what's going on and really coming together as communities to, you know, ensure that, like, you make it harder for this kind of speculative stuff to happen. And then why is this Jew different from all other Jews? He's Manish Tana, author, rabbi, African-American. A lot of the pushback is, well, are you like a Jew first or are you like black first? Mm. And that's a kind of ridiculous question to me. It's like asking the color purple, are you red first or are you blue first? Last week, we spoke about the impending arrival to Long Island City of Amazon's new headquarters. Then it was unofficial, but it's just been made official. They're coming, and so are the fears about what they'll bring with them, like stress to the neighborhood's infrastructure and an explosion in property values and rents. It looks like the voraciousness has already been unleashed, with accounts of some landlords contacting nearby tenants about buyouts. Politicians are considering how to roll back some of the gifts and tax breaks that Amazon is getting from the city to the tune of billions, it turns out, wanting to put some of that money towards fixing up the subways. We're interested in what's going to happen to renters and residents, and we're joined on the phone by a journalist who can help us understand the potential impact. Amy Plitt is the editor of Curbed New York. Happy to welcome you to the show, Amy. Thanks so much for having me. So I laid it out a little bit right there. There's (laughs) been some demonstrable changes in the neighborhood just built on the speculation of what's going to happen when Amazon moves down the block. But what are you guys seeing in the industry and checking out over at Curbed? Yeah, so there has definitely been an uptick in real estate interest in Long Island City. Um, You know, we got some stats from Street Easy today, which is a, you know, real estate listings website. And apparently the number of searches for apartments in Long Island City went up almost 300 percent in the week between when Long Island City began to be rumored as an HQ2 site and now. So there is interest spiking. And this is obviously going to put some pressure on the residents, not just in Long Island City already, but, you know, living in communities around it, like Sunnyside or Woodside, out to the east or Astoria to the north. So, you know, there's some real concerns about what's going to happen um, in those neighborhoods now. So taking all of that into consideration, is the sky really falling down as it concerns real estate and infrastructure in Long Island City and some of the places that might get run off from this now landed headquarters too? I think it's pretty early to say. You know, we only just know now some of the details about HQ2, like where, um, you know, where Amazon is planning to put it. So it's going to be closer to the waterfront uh, rather than being closer inland, even though they are going to also have an office of about one million square feet at one court square. Um, So like now we know where they're going to be. We know how much the city is and the state is planning to give them in subsidies. We know all of these things now, but we still don't really have a sense of exactly how this is going to affect things. I think mm-hmm. if you look at what has happened in Seattle, where housing prices have spiked, um, it's led to a lot of pressure on costs there. It's in Some people have say it's contributed to that city's homelessness problem. I mean, I think you can infer that there will likely be some pressure and some strain on the infrastructure in Long Island City, especially, you know, it's transit, which right. has a lot of transit options, but the subway is, you know, it is what it is. It's not... <laughs> always great. Um, but yeah, I think it's too early to say whether this is going to be an awful thing, but I think it's good to be skeptical or cautiously, you know, just cautious about it at this point. So looking at Crystal City in Virginia, where the other 
Amazon headquarters two, or maybe their number three, is going to be located. We know that that municipality is kicking in about two hundred million dollars to improve infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Long Island City, where the New York is going to be, happens to be blessed with what eight subway lines, thirteen bus lines, a commuter rail not so far from JFK. They've got bike sharing and all that jazz. So, yep. what should New York City be doing to kick in to maybe sure up some housing to make sure that folks aren't pushed out or bought out from their homes that are existing now? Yeah, I mean it's hard to say. So the city had announced not too long ago that it was committing $180 million to infrastructure improvements in Long Island City. That announcement was made a few weeks ago, so it's obviously, you know, the timing was kind of suspicious there. They must have known, like, what was coming down the pipe. Um, But I think probably one of the biggest things that the city and the state, this this all would really originate at the state level, could do to help ensure that people who are in, you know, rent-stabilized housing or people who are worried about losing their apartments as, you know, landlords start looking at this neighborhood as a place to to become speculative real estate. Um, You know, in 2019, the rent stabilization laws for New York City will expire, and those will have to be, uh, you know, discussed and talked about and renewed at the state level. So I think what people can do in the short term is put pressure on their legislators to sort of look at these laws, look at things like um, vacancy decontrol or you know, uh, preferential rent and things like that, and how those can be reformed and in some cases eliminated to yeah. make tenant protection stronger. Um, you know, real estate speculators are going to come into the neighborhoods around HQ2 and do what they're going to do. Well, they already have, from what you've reported, they're out yeah, there. You know, they already have, but if there are stronger tenant protections in place, then that will hopefully offset some of that a little bit. So, Amy, we know over at Curb, you guys are obsessed with these kind of things. So just from your standpoint, what can we tell folks in a sort of news you can use capacity who might be afraid of rent hikes and ways that they can defend themselves against what might be an impending wave? Yeah, I mean, like I said, I think Getting in touch with your city and state legislators is definitely one thing to do and just let them know, like, you are paying attention to what's happening and you know what's going on. As we just saw in the last midterm election, a lot of people who were not representing their constituents well were voted out. Um, So there's that fear that that could happen. There are a lot of groups that are working with tenants to ensure that protections are in place, like New York Communities for Change, which has been a pretty vocal voice against uh, HQ2 coming to the city, or Make the Road New York is another one. Um, And I think just banding together and making sure that you're talking to your neighbors and talking to the people in not just your building, but the buildings around you and finding out what's going on and really coming together as communities to, you know, ensure that, like, you make it harder for this kind of speculative stuff to happen. All right. So if you're at all concerned about this news and want to do something about it, there is a rally that's being scheduled for Wednesday morning at 1130 a.m. at the Gordon Triangle in Queens at the corner of 44th Drive and Vernon Boulevard. Amy, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. You've heard of POCs, but what about JOCs? I'm talking about Jews of color. Not such a rarity in other parts of the world, but here in the U.S., it's not a common combination. That's why our next guest gets a lot of double takes when he introduces himself, not only as an Orthodox Jew, but an Orthodox Jewish rabbi. So he's using his platform, or Bima, to help educate people about racism and the need for intersectionality in the Jewish community. And he's now armed with his fourth book, released earlier this year and tackling this subject matter. It's called Ariel Sampson, Freelance Rabbi. And we're happy it brings him to the show today. Welcome, Manish Tana, to 112 BK. Thank you for having me. Very happy that you accepted our invitation. <laughs> and we're going to get into this thing a little bit later. A little bit. But thematically, just from the open right there. Folks in America are not used to seeing black Jews. That's a true fact, I suppose. (laughs) How are you going to fix it? How many TV shows do you have lined up after this thing? I'm always working on on at least three or four projects at a time. 
uh, uh, but one thing I do find like interesting is when people say, like, I've never met like a black Jew of Jew of color. And like for me, it's really obvious to tell. Uh, but then I do this, and then I say, how do you know? I look like anyone else on the street. We look like anyone else on the street, actually. 25% though, yeah. of the American Jewish population is someone who is of color. So a little TV on the radio, just for you who are listening to the podcast, <laughs> tell us what you just did there. Oh, I Your secret identity. I removed my head covering, whether you call it a kippah or a yarmulke, because without that, I don't visibly flag as someone like who's Jewish. Right. So. So we had someone who was sitting in that chair just a few weeks ago who talked about this idea, an author who talked about dialing up his blackness in scales. Like sometimes I'm at an 11, if I do this and wear this and speak this way, I can get down to a good four sometimes. So you're <laughs> able to remove your head covering, yarmulke or kippah, but you have your blackness meter all the time. Do you think about that in terms of being incognito without a head covering at all, or what your Jewish level is versus your black level? Are they like in tandem? <laughs> uh, this reminds me a lot of the question of, uh, because I've been writing for about a decade on, on these sort of issues yeah. about racial and religious identity and how that intersection manifests in America, particularly around like American Judaism or African-American spirituality. Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of the pushback is, well, are you like a Jew first or are you like black first? Mm -hmm. And that's a kind of ridiculous question to me. It's like asking the color purple, are you red first or are you blue first? It's, uh -huh. it's purple, it's what it is. Like if I asked you, are you a man first or an American first? Like what's, by both those things and just not, like that dichotomy only exists when you look at me. That's not how I... When did the world tell you that that was a question to be answered? Like, by way of being out there? Because, I listen, we researched. I can cheat a little <laughs> bit. You are not a recent convert. You're a black Jewish man. But when did the world tell you that that was something that isn't a thing? As some African-American who grew up, you know, Chabad Lubavitch and Crown Heights in, like, the 80s, like, I was just you know, there, and there was never really a... Were you the only chocolate chip in the hall? No, no, there were actually uh, three uh, families from Crown Heights that we were sort of the African-American Jewish Chabad families. Mm -hmm. um, if you've ever heard of Speaker Yvila McCoy, she's from one of the three families, where there's the Rishons, the Fulchers, and the Francises. Um, so we sort of, you know, had that sort of meta knowledge that there were others in right. the neighborhood. We occasionally hung out together, but on that sort of day to day, week to week going to synagogue, yeah, it was pretty much just us there. And so there was never really a a sense of belonging to then have the question asked as to why you don't belong. It was sort of there from the beginning. Um, it was slightly the same way in school because I went to public school as you know an orthodox little you know black boy, and yeah, black. You know, elementary schools. You so, had to be one of one there. I was, I was one of one there. I was <laughs> definitely one of one there. Um, and so there, there was again. There was always. It, it wasn't as uh, hostile as a "you don't belong here," mm -hmm. but a, "oh, you're a different thing." Yeah. What does that mean? The so, brother from another planet, <laughs> sort of thing. So I get a lot of questions. Why did Jews do this or Jews do that? So there was never really a point of, I guess, assumed commonality to then have the question of yeah. you know, whether or not I existed. It was just there from... Let know, me ask you then, what don't black people know about Jewish people that became the main question for you as the conduit between those two communities? Because we talk a lot about the perceptions that uh, Jewish people have of Jews of color or inversely just of black people. But what is it that the black people were curious to know from you about? You're our man on the inside. <laughs> what do they do? Uh, well, one, it's an interesting thing, like even the phrasing of, you know, the conduit between those two communities, because neither community is a monolith. Mm -hmm. um, that's a lot of the inherent problem between trying to figure out, you know, conversations between the black and Jewish communities because right. there's two invisible parentheticals that are happening there. You really mean connections between the non-Jewish black communities uh -huh. and white Jewish communities. Gotcha. That excises relations between 
non-Jewish black and Jewish black communities. It excises between white Jewish and Jew of color communities. And so as long as that, there's that entire swath yeah. of that overlap not being addressed, there's never going to be a common point that happens between what the assumed uh, dichotomous properties of those communities Listen, are. we can expand that <laughs> Venn diagram even further. I remember Walter Mosley sitting right in that same mm -hmm. seat and saying, when did Jewish people become white? And there's another <laughs> spiral that starts to spin around in this context. But I'm still curious about that original question. What did the non-Jewish blacks question about what it is that Jewish people do or why they or what they kind of question that you might have encountered when you were a kid? Um, just questions around Jewish uh, ritual or life in general. Okay. That they just didn't feel... And at most, a lot of times, wasn't a uh, congenial enough environment mm. to ask like the sort of quote yeah. unquote regular Jews an open they saw exchange. About like, yeah, why do they do this? Oh, here's the answer. Why do they do that? But yeah. they, they have like Jews in their life in some way, shape, or form, or capacity with like oh, I don't feel comfortable. Not even asking you, or rather, not even get an answer. So, so there's a flip side to that question, obviously. But mm -hmm. before I go there, I want to ask: being that one of one, and being aware in your community that you were one of three of a particular kind of Jewish experience that may have been happening when you were growing up. Looking at that landscape, how is it that you saw your future? Did you think that it was like sort of preordained that you would always be explaining to one group or another? And if is that something that was a thread that ran through your family and those other two families that your destiny might be to grow into this person who's talking to these seemingly bifurcated nations where like, hey, I'm here and I'm here. <laughs> I, I can't speak to the experience of those two families because even as being African-American Orthodox Chabad Lubavitch families. We yeah. had three disparate families of family. um, ways of how we were even Jewish or how we even existed in those spaces. Yeah, every family is their um, own universe. Yeah, every every, uh, every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. I feel like it, you don't need to have different identities to think of ways where you'll be explaining something to somebody about yourself forever, like everyone yeah. has that. So I never really looked at it as a defining point of what my identity is. Like if you're so, someone that's really into like comic books, you're yeah. gonna spend your entire life explaining to other people. If you're if you're somebody from this part of the Caribbean, but come on, you know you're in a or, unique position. Like why didn't you become a graphic artist or uh, an accountant or something? It's there is a different <laughs> calling on you than like if you would have just been a guy down the street who didn't have this unique set of variables for this place that we live at this time that we're living in it. Well, I, I, that's not something I, this this entire, why I'm even here is not something I ever envisioned. I envisioned like just being a, a screenwriter or mm -hmm. a director, just doing films. Yeah. Uh, just general films of stories that I wanted to see. Sure, there was, you know, uh, if you want to call it an agenda to see more people of color like yeah. in like fantasy spaces. Like or, Wakanda. Uh, exactly. Or, uh, or other like places like that, but like I finished my first couple of screenplays, yeah, and I said to myself, "Well, you know, there's not a lot of you know Orthodox Jews for screenwriters. Definitely not a lot of African American Orthodox yeah. Jewish screenwriters. So, let's write a screenplay about that experience." That's How much of that do. is in this little tome, Ariel Simpson, freelance rabbi? There is a lot in that little tome. It's it's semi autobiographical. Four hundred and forty-five uh, pages <laughs> worth. <laughs> I am not the main character. The situations that the main character finds himself in yeah. are situations that I've been in. But the how many? Are like, very what's different. the balance? Because I could imagine you having rap sessions with other Jews of color and then pouring all of these things into you that you oh, redistributed I've, I've, here. I've sort of had access to those stories, not only just growing up, but even in the semi public sphere that I've inhabited as a Jew of color who speaks on issues that affect Jews of color. Right. So. Uh, I'd say maybe about 80% of the encounters yeah. are, are from either my life or someone I've known's life. Can you share one to shift our conversation <laughs> into a, another realm? Like what what's the story that jumps out? And full disclosure, I've not yet to read the book. I'm looking forward to getting into it. But lift the curtain a little for the folks listening. So there's a conversation that happens with Ariel uh, at a friend's like Friday night Shabbat dinner table. And while that specific um, 
encounter wasn't like a, a verbatim word for it. The kind of questions that happened in that uh, encounter, the feelings that happened, the sort of sense of entitlement to answers just because you asked a question, mm. uh, the sort of smokescreen, oh, I'm just curious, or it's just an aspiring story, or yeah. those kind of things. Those are all very... <laughs> I've experienced it. I, I, I don't think there's any Jew of color out there who has not experienced right. some version of that. So can I ask you the question, as the Jew of color in a lot of the spaces that you may pass through, mm -hmm. do you sometimes feel like, again, the inside man, people might be speaking more freely than they would in mixed company? Have you heard things that you may be privy to that my black self <laughs> wouldn't have access to just because I'm not a member of the tribe that might have informed the way that you see others seeing the world and folks who look like you in it? Ironically enough, there's not really that much that you've heard from the outside that I don't also hear from the inside. Mm -hmm. The difference is the same things are said, but it's sort of said, in a, oh, but you understand because you know you're different kind of way. So it's all the same things. The only thing that happens from my end is I get to dismantle those and say why they're ridiculous. What's in your tool belt to do that? <laughs> Sarcasm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Something in a, one of your writings that I read, there was that you said, there's no Olympics of oppression. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was a kind of genius line. Can you tell us what prompted that? Uh, it could have been one of several things. It could have been I could have been in a a black space uh, talking about slavery versus Holocaust. It could have been in a Jewish space talking about slavery versus Holocaust. Mm -hmm. um, Can you just say that again, just to, <laughs> just to let it sink in for people who are listening? We're talking about slavery mm -hmm. versus the Holocaust. Ding ding. In the context of there is no Olympics of oppression. Yeah. Um, I feel like those are, when it comes to these two perceived monolithic communities, those yeah. are the two sort of touchstone cultural traumas that everyone just, we had slavery, we had the Holocaust, which one is better and which one is worse. And I don't think you can really compare those two because if you took the dynamics of either mm -hmm. and applied it to the other, there would be you know, a, a much worse you know, turnout. Um, I did the math a few years ago, I believe. It was, right, so I was comparing the rate of Jews killed in the Holocaust according to the time that it happened in. Yeah. And I said if slavery was bad, yes, but African Americans were killed at that same rate, then the entirety of the continent would have been emptied out and destroyed by 1781, assuming that, uh, what's the, 1619, assuming a 1619 start date. That's right. By 1781, there'd be no black people in Africa. So the Holocaust was terrible, but slavery wasn't worse. Then on the flip side, I said, however, we look at like reparations and how long that's, how much has been paid out and uh, how many countries have had to pay it. And then we compare that to reconstruction. So if the response to the Holocaust after reciting reparations were equal to what African-Americans got, mm -hmm. then there would be 13.6 months of reparations and then to be done, as so, opposed to the past 60 years of this country as these subsidies or, or p families being able to reclaim this yeah. or reparations being paid out or things like that. So We are completely out of time, but I'm not going to let you go on <laughs> the mathematics of the Holocaust versus the accounting of transatlantic slavery. So just... Tell us one way that we can break down the seeming divide between two seemingly disparate cultures. The fact that nothing is ever a monolith and there's no real thing as whatever the authenticity of what you're conceiving is. You know, authentically Jewish isn't, uh, you know, Eastern Europe and gefilte fish and pickled herring, authentically black, isn't the black church. It's not, you know, the the slavery narrative. Those it's not Christianity. Those things aren't doesn't make you, don't make you any more authentically black or authentically Jewish than anything else. 
that exists. There's a wide spectrum in both those cultures that need to be addressed and we can't really move forward in our relationships with other communities if we haven't you know, figured out our own backyard yet. Ariel Sampson, Freelance Rabbi, is the book. You can get it now. <laughs> Thanks for stopping by. No problem. And finally, the issue on the table. Something that's been bugging us here at 112BK. Entomophagy. What? I don't know what that is. Entomophagy, that is. The practice of eating insects. The earliest mention of entomophagy can be found in the Bible. Basically, it was kosher to eat locust, crickets, and grasshoppers. Nevertheless, it's still a big no-no in many westernized societies where, with a few exceptions like bees, silkworms, and scale insects, there really isn't a steady practice of farming insects for consumption. The United Nations FAO, its food and agriculture organization, endorses edible insects as a way to address food scarcity. And once we grasp the sustainability aspect and its nutrition factor, we might begin to understand why this is a significant movement. For example, meat has an enormous water footprint. Did you know that it takes nearly 2,000 gallons of water to produce a single pound of beef? By comparison, it takes just one gallon to produce the same amount of cricket protein. Greenhouse gases and ammonia emissions? Edible insects emit much less than livestock. Plus, raising them doesn't require clearing land to expand production. And once you get past the ick factor, insects are healthy, nutritious, and rich in protein, good fats, and vitamins. According to the FAO, even the most underserved of society can take up insect harvesting thanks to being a low-tech, low-capital investment. So what needs to happen in America to change the way we perceive bugs? I guess it's a try it, you might like it scenario, like a thing with kids trying Brussels sprouts or mushrooms. Again, if you want dessert, you better pick up that fork. And now's your chance to try out some gourmet insect dishes. The second annual Brooklyn Bugs Festival is happening November 14th through 16th. There's a Bugs Giving Banquet Dinner that pays homage to Native Americans and America's culinary melting pot, as well as in-tow cooking demos and after-school children's programming. I wonder if they're going to serve wings. That's the show for today. Tomorrow, Jarrett Murphy will be back and talking about the criminal justice reforms that the state government might make with their shiny new Democratic majority. Hope you can check it out.